Hi, this is Mark Rivera, music director for Ringo Starr and his all-star band, and you're listening to Things We Said Today with Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci. Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about the world of the Beatles and what's happening in the news with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and many of you know me for another program that uh, I host, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, and can be found in a number of places. Too many to even mention here on this show. And uh, that would be, of course, our own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. Happy anniversary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we could say that all year, actually. True. Uh, on the show this time, we have yet but another very special guest. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten emails here from people saying, you know, you need to invite people on who live in Liverpool. Don't we get that all the time, Steve? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. You sound so convincing there. <laughs> and for yes, that, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> for that very reason, uh, we have a Beatles author here who many of you have heard of before. His name is David Bedford, and a few years back he wrote an excellent book, all on the city of Liverpool. It's called Liddy Pool, Birthplace of the Beatles. And he's just written another new book, which is called The Fab 104. And we're here to talk about that book with him. Welcome, David Bedford, to Things We Said Today. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Steve. Nice to be here. Uh, why don't we just talk about, first of all, what this book is all about and how you got the idea to write this particular book. It's, it's actually a very unique uh, presentation that you put together here. Yeah, thanks. Well, the, the idea actually came out of um, when I published Liddy Pool at the end of 2009, um, there was a chapter in there called The Fab 27. And it came just from a question from a Beatles fan who said to me, look, how did they go from being the Quarrymen to being John Paul George and Ringo? Which I thought was a quite simple answer, and it wasn't. I spent about three years just working on one chapter, just trying to find all the musicians. Well, when Liddy Pool was published, there was so much interest in that chapter, in the sort of the evolution of the Beatles, as it were. I thought there's more of a story here, because it's not just the musicians who were in the groups from the Quarrymen through to the Fab Four, but the groups they were in that led into the Beatles. But then I was going back to sort of my story with the Beatles, growing up in the Dingle, you know, going to the school where Ringo had gone to, so I had the Beatles around me, but I really got into it when I started playing guitar. And I remember I couldn't really have got going without a couple of friends of mine who taught me to play. And then I came across the story of uh, a guy called Ian James who taught Paul McCartney to play guitar. And I was thinking, there's a story there. And of course, John's mum, Julia, taught him to play. And that sort of got me on the road and thinking, there's the musical evolution of the Beatles. I wonder how many people are involved. And the number started, and we started at 27, then they got into the 40s, then they got into the 70s, and they ended up with 104 people in the story, just between 1956 and 62. That's pretty amazing right there, those many people. You know, that, that's one of the things that I like about this book is that you can easily point to so many of the people that you mention here and say, well, you know, that was kind of a minor role that that person played. But you never know if that person hadn't come along, if it, the Beatles story would have changed in any way. And I think that that's the interesting part. You know, if I said to you, how important was Arthur Pendleton to the story of the Beatles? The, the answer would only be, who the heck is Arthur Pendleton? <laughs> well, Arthur Pendleton was a neighbour of John's mum, and he gave John his very first harmonica lessons. Now, we, we think of, of the sound when the Beatles first started. You now, Love Me Do is dominated by the harmonica. 
just that little thing that Arthur Pendleton did, giving a little bit of time to John, some basic rudimentary lessons in how to play the mouth organ. How important was that? Sure. I mean, the harmonica was such an important instrument on a lot of the early Beatles records. What I found interesting was the way the book touched so many areas that you really didn't expect. I mean, it really kind of branches, it really takes the, the story, that evolution story that you were talking about, David, to a kind of a different, a new level. And that's, that's really, you know, one of the valuable things about that book. Well, thank you. And I think one thing that's been um, interesting over this weekend of the, the Festival of Beatles fans in New York is one of my special guests with me for the weekend was Jimmy James, who was a member of the Royal Caribbean Steel Band playing in the Jacaranda in 1960 at a time when the Silver Beatles weren't really a group and were turning up to watch these guys who were the stars. And you think the Royal Caribbean Steel Band was so important in the story because it was members of that group that went over to Hamburg. And because they did so well, they sent word back to Alan Williams and Lord Woodbine and said, get over here, there's a really good music scene. And of course, the Beatles end up in Hamburg, and we know what happened after that. So mm -hmm. important. Yeah, the Beatles were very interested in what a lot of the black musicians in Liverpool were playing at that time. Were they really the only ones of, of the white musicians that, that had a strong interest in, in that scene back then in Liverpool? Um, not the only ones, but one of the stories I've been very keen to tell, and I think it's the biggest chapter in the book, is what I call the black roots of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a very interesting part of Liverpool, talks of, of which part is the Dingle, where Ringo's from, where I'm from. And the Afro-Caribbean population had, had settled in there. And when I started digging and doing the research, I have realised there was a segregation line in Liverpool. In talks of the black guys were there, they didn't cross the line and go into the city centre. You hardly would see a black face there. They stayed, they had their own clubs. But the upper Parliament Street, where the dividing line was, coming off there was Hope Street, where Gambia Terrace, and of course, John and Paul, George and Stu. It was a quick walk down there. It's easy to go to the, the black clubs as it was to go down into the city centre. So they were hanging out in these clubs, and it wasn't just the locals who were there, because what had then started discovering is that we had um, a US air base called Burton Wood. It's about 10 miles outside of Liverpool. And it was the biggest US air base outside of the United States. And it was huge during the Second World War. So they had about, I think it was about 18,000 US servicemen based there. They were segregated on the base. So the, the white servicemen were going to the city centre. The black guys were coming to the black clubs. They were bringing their records with them. So suddenly, John and Paul in particular were hanging out in these black clubs and they were talking to these American servicemen and listening to their American records. And of course, at that time, all the groups were trying to get one up on each other, trying to find a song that the others <laughs> weren't doing. And that's what they were finding. That's how they were discovering these songs. Now, some of the other musicians were hanging out there as well. But it was predominantly, it was predominantly the Beatles who were hanging out in these clubs. They were mainly the black guys in the clubs. And the story is just so, it's just so, gets so complicated and and so, you know, interwoven. There's just so many places to go, and you know, there's so many, there's so many things that you never would have guessed. For example, the 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 um, Tennis and Roland photographs of the Silver Beatles. I mean, those are. Those are just those are marvelous, um, you know. To, to that you got him, for example. That you know, there's just so many different facets of the of the story that are that are told here. Um, yeah, I know you go through the um, the Pete Best thing, and being from Liverpool, I've talked to other people from Liverpool who have told me that there is still a very strong feeling for Pete. Pete was not dismissed. Americans kind of dismissed Pete Biddle, but Liverpool, people from Liverpool did not. Do you want to explain that a little bit for people that maybe not don't understand that or don't, you know, or, or haven't heard that before? Because I know that 
like I said, I've, heard, I've talked to several people who, who have told me this. What, how do you feel about the whole PPS situation? I know you go through it in the book, but... Um, well, yeah, it, was, it was an important part of the story when I was, I was doing Liverpool. And, yes, yeah, certainly from a Liverpool point of view, the whole story of Pete being dismissed and Ringo taking his place, suddenly, you know, completely out of the blue, recording contract was already there. And, in a way, there was so much loyalty towards Pete from having musicians as well as the fans, they could not understand it. And it, it's one of those, probably one of the darkest periods, as it were, mm-hmm. of Beatles history because Pete had been there for two years and then suddenly, within a couple of weeks of starting to make the first record, Pete called in by Brian, he sacked, told Ringo's replacing him, Ringo's in, and within a couple of weeks, they're down at Abbey Road and starting to, to make a record. And it's a mystery because there are so many unanswered questions. And one thing, well, hang on. If we go down to the comments from George Martin, he was saying, well, Brian, I don't mind what you do with the group, but instead of using Pete, I'm going to bring in a session drummer. Well, that's got to be a catalyst for what happened. But there's been so many stories that have developed over the years. And I think there's a lot of myth, a lot of legend, and even a bit of revisionist history going on here. They're reinventing what happened because there are so many versions and none of them are definitive. Obvious questions like, if George Martin's going to bring in a session drummer to replace Pete, first of all, at what point did Brian contact George Martin and said, by the way, we've sacked Pete Best and we've got a new drummer. There's no paperwork ever turned up with that. If George Martin is going to bring in a session drummer to replace Pete, as he said, why was there no session drummer there on the 4th of September when the Beatles first go down to record? Session drummer, Andy White, only turns up when he's asked to replace Ringo the following week. There are so many versions of what's gone on, and we still don't know exactly what the truth is. Something happened. So many different reasons have been given, and it's still so unclear. So, yeah, in in Liverpool, there's a lot of sympathy and a lot of support for for Pete and for what he was put through. How do you feel about what Mark Lewison has written about on this very subject in his uh, new book, All These Years Tune In?, because he does give all the reasons why Pete was fired. And as I've said to you, I just interviewed you privately, he makes a a very convincing case there based upon what several people, notably Burt Camfort, who produced the Beatles recordings with Tony Sheridan, Mike Smith, who engineered the recordings at DECA, and also George Martin, all not being happy with, with Pete as a drummer. On top of all that, the issue of whether or not he really fit in personality-wise with the Beatles and the fact that he didn't, you know, hang out with them all that much. I mean, it's a very compelling case that Mark has has brought here, and he does very thorough, very exhaustive research on the subject. So how do you feel about, you know, all the information that Mark has brought to the table? Um, It's an interesting point, and I think that there are two elements to what Mark has written. The first one is, as you say, makes a compelling case there, because as we know, yet the Camfer had problems recording Pete, which is no surprise. The drums, from a musical point of view, are the hardest things to record anyway. Pete's sound was very dominating with the bass drum, which would have been an absolute nightmare to record. So yes, we know there was the problem in Hamburg, and we know the problem with Decker and with EMI. So that I can understand from a technical point of view why George Martin is saying, yeah we're going to bring a session drummer in, which wasn't that unusual back then. So that's the first element. But the second element, which I don't quite get with the angle that Mark has taken, which is that it was Ringo all the way. It was always Ringo who was going to replace him, because that's not what the evidence suggests. The evidence says that a number of drummers were considered and... What I found um, hidden 
in uh, another book was an interview by a journalist called Chris Hutchins who interviewed Ringo in November 1962. So this is before the Beatles are famous. You know, Love Me Too's only just come out. And they asked Ringo about how he was replaced. And the story only takes place the weekend before Pete is dismissed. Um, George Harrison goes to Ringo's house, I think it's on the Friday. Ringo's still down in Wales at Butlins with Rory Storm. Leaves a message with Ringo's mum and says, when he comes back, ask him to call. Ringo gets the message on Saturday when he's back in Liverpool. Rings up the Beatles. They say, come down to the odd spot club in Liverpool we're playing. So he goes down to see them. After the gig, they say, we're going to the Blue Angel, but Pete's not coming. Come with us. They take Ringo. That Saturday night, they introduce him to Brian. Brian and Ringo then have a chat with the other lads. At which point, obviously, Brian then makes the offer to Ringo. Would you like to join? Was it a matter of a few days later, what to say, was it the Tuesday? Pete's brought in and is told Ringo's replacing him. The following Saturday, Ringo's in. So, this is all pretty last minute. If it has been such a, a definite thing that has been on the cards for so long, why is it only happening within days? If it was always going to be Ringo who was going to replace Pete, and they always wanted him, and Pete was not a good enough drummer, they had plenty of time to get rid of Pete. You know, Pete was there for two years, drummed for hundreds of hours with them, was very much part of the Beatles' sound, Hamburg and Liverpool, which made them famous. So there were plenty of opportunities, and maybe after the Tony Sheridan recordings, when Camper has problems recording Pete. Nah, maybe not. OK, but then he goes to the Decker ones. They could have done it then. If they'd always wanted Ringo, well, he was restless at the end of 61. He quits Rory Storm, goes to Hamburg with Tony Sheridan, doesn't stay there long, gets fed up, comes back again, is available yet again, but rejoins Rory Storm. If there was such an issue with Pete, and Ringo was always going to be the guy to replace him, there were plenty of opportunities. But why were other drummers approached? And why was it done so last minute? Now, what I always say is, in hindsight, you cannot disagree with the choice they made. Ringo was the perfect guy to fit in with John Paul and George. So you cannot disagree with that. But what we, I always say, as a historian, you have to make your case and you have to see what information was available at the time they made the decision. And I think as far as they were concerned, if something was, was questioned, it was probably the last straw. And this was their last chance, really, to get a recording contract, to make it. So they probably panicked and said, OK, peaked out. There was no great friendship, no great loyalty. So they got rid of him. And they knew Ringo, and they grabbed him along for the ride. And it was the right choice. I just don't see it as being such a long-term plan that it was always going to be Ringo. Well, the argument could be made, and, and, and you were just saying this, that this was their last chance. And if George Martin said that he wasn't pleased with, with Pete Best, then they had to make a move at that moment. I mean, they could have been thinking about Ringo for quite a while, and they were hanging out with him, and they were friends with him, and they knew him from Rory Storm. They loved his drumming. They always thought highly of him. And despite the fact that, as you were just saying there, David, that, you know, he would quit Rory Storm, he wasn't happy with Tony Sheridan, he still always found work. He was thought highly enough where he can always find work as a drummer. So, you know, he was one of the most successful drummers in Liverpool at that time anyway. So it wouldn't have been that much of a, of a shock, you know, for, for them to pick him, especially because he, he blended so well personality-wise with the group, in addition to his drumming. Well, well, an interesting thing that you say about blending personality-wise, you know, a lot of the stories, a lot we've always been told, have been, you know, George was closest to him and was, was very keen to get Ringo in. Though, I've read in interviews with Ringo where he found it easier to go on with John and Paul quickly and it took a bit longer to get closer to George. And uh, Ringo has, has said, you know, it took a while to join them not just as a drummer, 
but as a person, as a member of the group, it's a while to be accepted. And this is the, the hindsight thing. As you say, he was the perfect fit. They didn't know that at August 62. We know, looking back, that it was the perfect fit. And he, so at no point, I'm not questioning Ringo's talent as a drummer. Absolutely not. You know, he was one of the top drummers in Liverpool. What I'm saying is, at August 62, they did not know he would be the perfect fit. We know eventually it did work out. So we can't use that as the argument. We've got to say, in August 62, what did they know? And that's where there's the different different strands to this whole debate. Is that, okay, definitely, they had to make the decision. And you can understand, with the way it was, there was no great loyalty with Pete. And, yeah, this was their only chance. They might have fame for six months, maybe. And if Pete was going to cost them that, they panic, they get rid. So you can understand where that's come. And as I say, I don't disagree that Ringo was the ideal person because it worked out. But we couldn't have known that, and they couldn't have known that at August 62. And so I think, and that's coming back to the original point you're saying with, with Mark Lewison's research, I don't disagree with what he said. As you can see, the leading up to why they then decided to get rid of Pete. What I, I can't quite go with is I don't see that it was always, always, always going to be Ringo. Because if mm-hmm. it was, why within the previous few weeks were other drummers approached? Now, what other drummers were, as long as you mention that? Yeah, but there were um, other drummers. Johnny, Johnny Hutchinson was, uh, was approached by Bobby Graham, who was the drummer with Joe Brown and the Brothers. You know, and you think he was a professional drummer with a successful artist already, but he was approached. And around Liverpool, there are suggestions that two, maybe three other drummers were considered. Now, if that was going on, it can't always and always have been Ringo. And I think Mark points that out in his book as well. He mentioned that other drummers had been approached and then Ringo was approached. So it sort of contradicts that it was always going to be Ringo if the evidence says, well, there were at least others were considered before he was asked. Mm, I didn't pick that up in, in Mark's book about other drummers being approached. I think the Beatles, at least the way that he wrote it, they were very comfortable with Ringo and they really wanted him at that time. But, but when was that um, interview, when was that information gathered? From, well, that would have to be around that time of 62 and probably leading up to that, just from becoming friends with him and seeing him drumming and the few times that he sat in for Pete. Well, Again, that's been one of those uh, incredible statistics, which I think Pete successfully sued Ringo. Um, he tried to claim, I think one thing he said that Pete used to make himself sick, and Ringo sat in with him a number of times. It was, I think, too definite. Could be a possibly a third time. That was all. So it wasn't happening a lot. And also, I, I think it's in... I, I, I didn't, I didn't say... I didn't. Sorry, I didn't say that it was happening a lot, but there is one particular instance right before Pete was, was let go where Ringo sat in and it was like they knew this was right. They really felt who, like it was the perfect fit. Who said that they knew this was right? Mark says it in his book. Yeah. But when is that information gleaned from? And say this is the problem because once Ringo was in and, it, and they become famous and they start talking about that time, they're going to be saying that. What else are they going to say? They've got to be saying it was always going to be Ringo. You know, he was our great mate from back then. It was always going to be him. Musicians from bands sat in for each other on a regular basis. There was no evidence there which says it was always going to be Ringo. And in fact, I think, I think it's in the anthology. And Paul's talking about they do the first recording on 4th of September. Then they go listening to the acetates with George Martin. And Paul's comments were, well, you have to understand that Ringo wasn't that steady on time, you know, back then. But he did improve, and, you know, he showed he was a good drummer. Now, that's Paul's comments about Ringo's drumming in September 62. Now, if he was always going to be the drummer, 
and he was the best in Liverpool, which again is a contentious subjective thing, particularly in Liverpool. If he was always going to be him, why are they not surprised that you think he wasn't that steady on time? But, you know, he got there. It's easy to make comments 10, 20, 30 years later and say, well, it was always going to be this. But that's that's not objectively what the evidence suggests. Okay, you, um, you, you, you made your point, but I do think that, like we just said, they had to make a decision based on what George Martin said then. So then they had they had to consider someone else. I agree, and that's why I say that's why there's two separate parts to this this discussion. The one is the decision with Pete, and you can see on um, it's George Martin's comments that, that that does it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But that's the first element to it that they suddenly they thought they panicked. You know, this is our only chance. So, yeah, there wasn't any great friendship. There wasn't any great loyalty. And quite often, you know, drummers weren't considered an integral part of a band. And when you look back and think, well, John Paul and George have been together in groups since December 1957. That's where the heart of the Beatles was. It was in those three. So, yeah, they went through a number of drummers. So in a way, it wasn't a massive surprise because of what George Martin said. But that's the first element to it, which... You know, I, I agree with what you're saying. The second element is who replaces Pete. And I just think there's been a lot of, OK, we need to go back and really justify why we picked Ringo and say it was always going to be Ringo. And I don't think they can genuinely say that because that's not what the evidence suggests. Hmm. Let, me, let, me ask a, uh, uh, let me ask a question, David. You mentioned Bobby Graham. Um, and, I, and I'm looking through the book here, and I don't see his name. You, is he number 105? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because he, he doesn't make it into the, into the story. Um, okay. To, to he, qualify he was, 104, you've got to was, have been a member of the group or performed with them. Okay, so he was the... Uh, uh, refresh my memory on who he was. He did work with uh, Joe Brown and the brothers. Okay. Um, and he was approached by Brian. And again, that was, I think, was in around the June time. Anyway, so that shows that it was quite soon after the, um, the June 6 audition with George Martin. So I think that goes to show that it was what George Martin said that really sparked it. We need the replacement. Okay. Um, and I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, Ken, but I think it was in um, one of the interviews that you did with Mark. Yeah, because you asked him about this, this whole subject. I sure did. He actually mentioned about um, other drummers being approached. Yeah, I asked and, him that, and he denied that the Beatles were even thinking about Johnny Hutch. You know, because he wasn't, he wouldn't have been the right fit, because he was in the Big Three, and the Big Three were pretty well loud and raunchy, and probably you know it wouldn't have been the right suitable drummer for the group? Well, I think anybody on the, from a musical point of view, I think it was Bob Waller who says that, that Johnny Hook was, was discussed because I think it was his recommendation to Brian. And Johnny was certainly considered, but, and he said that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have left the big three because he thought the big three were making a better sound anyway. Right. Um, and he, he certainly had a, a loyalty to Pete and it, he and John clashed. That they had because they had played together before, but it it, it wouldn't have worked. Right. Hmm. So that's just he, Johnny was certainly the the best drummer in Liverpool. That's what the, the musicians um, at the Mersey era would say. But even though Bob Wooler suggested it, the Beatles themselves never really considered it. From what I've read and what I understand, a lot of the contacts were through Brian. It wasn't John Paul and George making the the approaches. Um. So people were, were considered, and so it came down to middle of August when Ringo was then brought into the picture, introduced to Brian. They'd obviously then decided that's what they wanted to do. They introduced Ringo to Brian. They have a chat. Obviously make their arrangements. Pete's dismissed, Ringo joins. Can I ask a question, uh, David? Who's the most unusual sure. person that you... 
I mean, of all the new people that enter into the story in the book, who's the most unusual piece, to, piece um, of the puzzle? Oh, the, I think that the most exciting piece of the puzzle is the one that sort of rewrites the, the Beatles' timeline. Because there's always been debate as to when the Quarrymen started. And you talk to the guys from the Quarrymen, and they always say, sort of late summer, 56, going to 1956. Um, again, come back with, with, uh, with Mark's book. You know, he's always been an advocate of March 57, and the Quarrymen sort of disagree. But March 57 is when John had his guitar bought for him by his mum. What I've been able to do is I found a guy called Jeff Lee. Jeff used to sit next to John at school. And in an interview I did with Eric Griffiths for Liverpool, he said there was a guy called George Lee who suggested starting the Quarrymen, but nobody knows what happened to him. Through reading Liverpool, his son got in touch with me and said, oh, that's my dad. He's actually Jeff Lee, not George Lee. George was a nickname at school. And I interviewed him, and he confirmed that he was a good friend of John's. John would often be singing in school. And Jeff said to John, why don't we start a skiffle group? You're a good singer. You could have fun with it. And then Jeff had a guitar which he couldn't play. He gave that guitar to John. Hmm. So actually, the first guitar that John learned to play on was one that came from a school friend. So I thought, okay, this does support what the lads in the quarrymen are saying. Now, how can I verify that? And I was able to find a quote from from John, from an interview from, from years back, where he said, actually, the first guitar that I played was one I borrowed from a school friend. That is the school friend. So finding Jeff Lake, he's written the very, very start of the Beatles story with the quarrymen. Nobody's ever spoken to him before, nobody's ever interviewed him before, and it was just so exciting to talk to him and, as you say, to rewrite a bit, a bit of Beatles history. You're awesome. Ken? Uh, David, tell us more about Lord Woodbine, because he's someone who's much more important to the Beatles story than, than most books have ever given him credit for. Oh, absolutely. Lord Woodbine has been largely written out of people's history. Um, his name is Harold Phillips. He came over from Trinidad. He was a Calypso singer, songwriter, and he became a business partner of Alan Williams. Now, in 1960, Alan Williams is credited with being the Beatles' first manager. In Liverpool, it's always been he was Alan and Lord Woodbine together. And when I, I discussed this with, with Alan only last year, he said, we were business partners. We managed the Beatles together. And quite often, some of the guys he talked to, the Beatles in 1960, Silver Beatles as they were at that point, were sometimes referred to as Woody's Boys. And I thought, I'm going to start digging. And this comes into this topic of the Black Roots, the Beatles. And I found a quote that McCartney gave. And he was, he was talking to somebody, who's, I can't remember who it was, and he was talking about 1960. And Paul said, oh, that was back in our Lord Woodbine days. And I thought, well, there you go. Paul can reassert that. That time in 1960, when Alan and Lord Woodbine became the Silver Beatles manager, they got them a drummer. First of all, Tommy Moore, then Norman Chapman, and then, of course, Pete Best. It was Alan and Lord Woodbine who went over to Hamburg, set up the deal with going to the clubs over there. And then, of course, that, that famous picture in the war um, memorial outside Arnhem, where it's the Beatles, Alan Williams, and Lord Woodbine, who are pictured together. And he took them over there. And really, Alan Williams is often dismissed as the man who gave the Beatles away in a bit of a joke. What Alan and Lord Woodbine did in those months in 1960, without them, we wouldn't have had the Beatles. They got them together, they got them organized, they got them to Hamburg. And Hamburg is where they really became such a great rock and roll group. And he's, he's an amazing character. He was so important in that part of Beatles history, but it's very rarely talked about. 
So I thought, now's the time to give him and people like that the, the credit they deserve in Beatles history. How's, um, how's Alan Williams doing today? Um, he's not in the best of health. Last time I saw him, he was actually in a wheelchair. He's had a couple of falls. He'd um, broken his hip mm. was last year. And it, he's starting to look quite frail. He's into his 80s now. Mm. Still in very good spirits. Still as sharp as a button. <laughs> um, at least before noon anyway. It depends <laughs> what time of day you speak to him. <laughs> but physically, he's he starting to look really, really frail. Mm. Okay. I'm, I'm glad he's he's doing well for, you know, in, in his 80s. That's good. David, um, I'm going to mention something here that will make your, your book become number one on the bestsellers market here. <laughs> this is, this is going to be your ace in the hole here. Um, you actually have a photo, and you can tell us all about a part in Beatle history that uh, a lot of people just don't know about. And that, of course, has to be Janice the Stripper. <laughs> Janice the Stripper is revealed at last. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It's one of those stories, again, Alan Williams, Lord Woodbine, they had a strip club um, called Shabines. That was the, the official name for them. because they, Of course, they were illegal. Alan was trying to find them work, and they weren't getting any gigs. So Alan and Lord Woodbine said, well, we've got this new stripper called Janice come over from Manchester, but she has certain qualities and a bit of class because... She won't take her clothes off the record. It has to be live music. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, boys, you know, you've got a week to work here. And they said, well, hang on, we're a rock and roll band. We're not backing a stripper. And they said, well, you've got no other bookings. You want some money. And I think Paul's quote is just, we took the money just for the indignity of it. And they play on this little, about six or seven foot square stage. It's uh, John, Paul, George and Stuart. Paul was playing drums that week. Janice took a shine to young George. <laughs> but we've never known much about her. And it was when I was talking to Janice and Roland, and we were looking through the photos, because he was like the official photographer at the Jacaranda. And he did all the stuff for Alan, as we were saying before about the, the Silver Beatles and the, the Larry Parnes audition. And we came across a photo of Alan with Janice. And we examined that. And... Chen looked through his photos and said, I photographed her in the jacaranda, and he found two photos of her. Mm. And so, again, for the first time ever, we got photos of Janice the stripper. So for the, uh, the younger listeners, I would say she is fully clothed. <laughs> you know, she looks kind of like, <laughs> I hate to say this, like a homely <laughs> Annette Funicello. <laughs> I'll leave I the descriptions to you, Ken. <laughs> But that's certainly an interesting part of their history right there for a whole week backing up a stripper. It is. And talking of photos never seen before, you know, straight after that, Tommy Moore, their drum was gone. And I found there's three amazing photos of Tommy from uh, 1970, which had never been seen before. But the guy who replaced him, Norman Chapman, we've known a bit about him, but there's never been a published photo of Norman anywhere. There's been very little information. And I was able to track down his daughter. And she very, very kindly trusted me with Norman's story and about a dozen photos. So a complete exclusive, the only book to have any photos of Norman Chapman, who was the Silver Beatles drummer, for about six or seven weeks, June, July, 1960. And he was a good drummer. I found quotes from George Harrison and even Ringo. Says, you know, the guy talks about this guy is a really good drummer. And it's one of those hard luck stories that Norman would have gone to Hamburg with the Beatles, but a few days before they're due to go, he got his call up papers, had to go and do national service and join the army for two years. Hmm. And so Norman's tenure as the, the drummer with the Beatles was over. But a few days before they had to go to Hamburg, that was the phone call to Pete Best. Do you want to come and join us? All right, actually, we just had 
a bit of a mishap here because we lost Steve on the phone. So we're just going to wrap things up with a few more questions. And I just wanted to ask you, David, if you can comment about a few more people that are mentioned in the book. Johnny Gentle is someone who we all know the Beatles had a tour with in Scotland in 1960. How important was that tour in, in their history? I think it's one of those periods, again, 1960 was a watershed for the Beatles, and that tour they did has generally been written off as a disaster. You know, it was a nightmare a couple of weeks going around Scotland, and nothing much happened. They ran out of money. But actually, when you, you start looking into it a little bit more closely, you find Johnny Gentle's version of what went on. And you start reading some of the comments that, you know, John and the guys made. You realize that it, it wasn't the disaster that people tried to say it was. And an interesting observation from Johnny Gentle was that by the time the group was getting to the end of the tour, the Beatles were doing their own slot as well as backing him. He said, And they were getting a brilliant response, sometimes better than even he was getting. And he said the improvement was measurable. And so I, I don't think it, it can be written off as a disaster. And I think that really was a very good foundation to prepare them for going off to Hamburg, which is only just, uh, what, three months later? Yeah, it also proved that they could build an audience just exactly. on their own material. Yeah, and I, I think that was important. You know, they, for once, were away from home only for a couple of weeks, but they were on the road. They were touring a different country. And I think from the first night to the last night, the improvement were, was massive, and I think it gave them a lot of confidence. So I, I think it was a good ground, and even if maybe the time they didn't enjoy it as much, I think when they look back, they realized how important it was. Hmm. Okay. I know that some books have written about this, but how much can you tell us? It's very interesting that after Brian Epstein signed with the Beatles, the very next gig that they played, John was sick. And he couldn't make it to the show. And they actually had Rory Storm there to take his place. How much do you know about that particular night? Well, it was one that um, Brian arranged via Sam Leach. And Sam did quite a lot of the promotions on the Wirral. And Brian did it as his, his first sort of proper promotion. And it was a very, very small hall called McDonough Hall in West Kirby, a little seaside resort on the Wirral. And John had laryngitis, and so Brian didn't make a lot of money for it, but he was determined it was going to go ahead. It had been promoted, and instead of pulling out, he said, well, let's just grab somebody we know well. And, of course, the Beatles and Rory Storm, the Hurricanes, had done a lot of stuff, Hamburg and Liverpool together. So they just called up Rory Storm and said, can you do it? And sure enough, he stepped in. Hmm. And do you know anything about how well it went? Well, I don't think it was a disaster, but it, it's one of those things where it was, it was a really, really small hall, and a lot of the places they were playing at the time, you could maybe get 70, 80 people in there at the most. It's not as bad as some of the ones that they did where Brian booked them in, places like uh, called the YMCA halls, uh, again over on the Wirral, which is just over uh, the River Mersey from Liverpool, hmm. and... It was a different type of audience, and on at least one occasion, they were booed off because it was the wrong type of audience for them. Wow. That was, that was uh, a bit of a surprise for them, I'm sure. Very much, because they were used to you know, the Casbah, the Cavern over in Hamburg, getting this amazing reception. And Brian was trying to get them out of the purely rock and roll clubs into more of a, a variety circuit, but it, it wasn't always successful. Can you just touch on, and, and I've heard quite a lot about this, where Rory Storm is concerned. You know, he had this tremendous following, and, and before the Beatles became the number one band in Liverpool, Rory Storm was with the Hurricanes. So what was it about him? Why do you suppose he never really ever made it big? Rory was the first of the really great showmen. He, he was an amazing talent, an amazing performer, and full energy, unlike anybody had seen before. They were talking to some of the Mersey musicians, not blessed with the greatest voice, but a really good voice mm -hmm. um, and a great performance. But I think, and this was going back to when Ringo was starting to get frustrated 
the Butlins holiday camps and those were probably as far as they were going to get. He didn't quite have enough to get it onto the next level, but it was an absolutely amazing performer. And you know, everybody talks about there was nobody to touch him in Liverpool. Rory Stone was just incredible. And it was one of those amazing stories where when he was off stage, he had a really bad stammer. Mm -hmm. Very, very hard to communicate. But get him on stage, get him singing. Completely different person. Yeah, he he certainly goes down as one of the best performers ever to come out of Liverpool. But if he was such a great performer, why is it on that basis alone he still couldn't have had the kind of success? I mean, if, if you're at that level where you're the number one band in Liverpool... I mean, granted, it's not beyond Liverpool, but in Liverpool, if you're number one and you're staying at the top level for several years, you know, what is it that made him not really reach that top? I mean, performance alone, you can build such a huge audience, and he was able to do that. Oh, yeah, and, and we've seen ever since. You know, a lot of people with far less talent, but a good show, have made millions. It's about having the right management and getting the, the right records and the right PR. And I don't think he, he ever had that. And I, and it was a shame because I think it was only really the, the Liverpool audiences that, that got to see one, one of the truly great performers. And I think, yeah, that they could have made it with the right guidance. Hmm. And once the Beatles caught on, you would have thought that so many of the other Liverpool bands that did become successful, on the backs of the Beatles' success as well, you would have thought Rory Storm could have made it. Yeah, and I think what was the, the problem for most of the groups. What the Beatles had that was different was they were such great songwriters. If you didn't have enough original material, then you had to rely on your record company finding the right songwriters to give the group the right song, mm. to get the right promotion, to get into the charts. Since we just mentioned Rory Storm, there are several recordings that we've heard about that the Beatles were involved with with Lou Walters. And we've heard that Summertime, the George Gershwin classic, was recorded, as well as Fever, which Peggy Lee had a big hit with, yep. uh, and September Song, the standard right there. What can you tell us about that? And uh, I know a recording was made, but we still haven't uncovered it. It is one of those frustrations, because there are you know, the, the, these different reports. And whereas we have an image which I think originally appeared in um, Alan Williams' book of the actual record disc, that, um, which uniquely, it's, it's the first time you have John Paul, George and Ringo appearing on a record together, on mm-hmm. uh, 15th of October 1960 in Hamburg. And again, like with Tony Sheridan, the idea was for Lou Walters, who was you know, a good singer, he sang like, the ballads in Rory Stum, The Hurricanes. I think it was Alan Williams' idea just to make a record and said, let's get some musicians of course, he brings his drummer, who was Ringo, and uh, his friends John Paul and George from the Beatles, and gets him into the studio in Hamburg. The problem is there's very little that has survived. We've seen we've got the image of of the record, but there's not much documentation then to go alongside whatever happened, what was recorded. So you, again, you're coming down to people's memories as to what they think they recorded and what you can prove, hmm. and with the only real evidence is that picture of the record, and the record has since been lost as well. So it's difficult when, you, when you're doing your research and you get a story. You need to try as much as possible to back it up with evidence. That's the only evidence we've got left. We know the date it took place, and we know that because of um, Johnny Guitar from Rory Stone the Hurricanes kept a diary parts of it which have been published. So we know that it took place on the 15th of October 1960. Mm-hmm. But we haven't got much else evidence, much of evidence to go along with it to back up and say exactly what was recorded. There's no track listing. There's no other paperwork, unfortunately. Not even for summertime? Well, that's the one that they're, they're almost definite. That's the one that, that was recorded. They're pretty sure summertime and fever. But again, it, it, it's the lack of paperwork, whereas when you look at... Um, the sessions with, with Tony Sheridan and with Bert Camfort. Mm-hmm. There's so much paperwork of what was recorded, what sessions, how many times, etc., what dates, all the paperwork's there. It's, so now we, you know, we can back up what was done. 
we don't have that paperwork with this recording. One last person I want to bring up, a uh, fascinating name, Roy Young. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell us about him? Because from everything I've heard about him, he, he still is a great musician that played a lot with the Beatles, and they even offered to have him join the band. Yeah, the, Roy Young, again, one of those incredible stories. Um, he was considered Britain's answer to Little Richard, um, a white guy with what most people would say is a black voice still performing, and an absolutely unbelievable voice, brilliant boogie-woogie piano player. And he was out in Hamburg and was set up helping to manage the new Star Club. So the Beatles get booked, and they end up playing on stage with Roy. They became really good friends, and they played a number of times together on stage. So much so that Brian said, you know, you've got great chemistry, you're an amazing uh, pianist, we'd like you to come back to Liverpool and join the Beatles. Roy had just started as the, the manager and the booking agent at the Star Club and turned Brian down. And when I spoke to him about it, and he says, everybody asks me the same thing, do I regret it? And I just say, every night I bang my head against the wall. But in the end, he went on to have an amazing recording career. Um, because from the biggest names like David Bowie, um, up the Hoople, people like this, he's had a, a brilliant career. Mm-hmm. But he could have been a Beatle, and that was, what was it, April 1962, just before they were about to find fame. That's pretty amazing right there. <laughs> 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 the whole Beatles story gets more and more fascinating of so many twists and turns in that story, and if one thing hadn't happened, then it, it may have changed, you know, the history in so many ways. You know, and, it but, could, and it goes back to and we said the interesting ones, this guy, Jeff Lee, who says to John, why don't you start a skiffle group? You go all the way back to the beginning, there's so many of these little occurrences, and you think, history could have been changed at that point. Of course, you can also say that John loved music so much, it was inevitable that he would form a band. Absolutely. I think it, it would have happened. It didn't take much of a suggestion to sort of get them into action. Mm-hmm. But all these various people, and I enjoy knowing about Jeff Lee, as well as um, certainly Ian James. Yes, Very absolutely. important right there. I mean, he taught Paul the songs that Paul performed to John. Yeah, and, and Paul gives him the credit for that. Mm. And they're still friends today. Okay, well, this has been a blast. <laughs> <laughs> and it always is, David, and I want to thank you so much for joining us. And much luck with the book, which is called The Fab 104. And uh, be sure to join us again. Thanks very much. It's been great fun. All right. That puts a wrap on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. And on behalf of Steve Marinucci and David Bedford, author of The Fab 104, we all want to say thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time.